Happy Sabbath. Thank you so much, Pastor Tanya, for that introduction. Uh, very nice thing. Thank you so much. Uh, we did cross paths in seminary uh, where it is much colder than it is here. Uh, I don't know how we survived uh, those couple years that we were there, but we made it, and now we're here in sunny California. Sometimes sunny. I know it's raining right now, but um, I'm very happy to be here and um, thankful for this opportunity to come and share with you all. Um, so a few, maybe let's say seven, eight, eight-ish years ago, I had first heard the story of um, a very important person who shaped my walk with God, and his name is George Mueller. I don't know if anyone has heard of George Mueller. If you have, I wanted to see, raise a hand. A few people, okay. So George Mueller um, actually uh, opened up orphanages in England a long, long time ago. And I was watching this documentary about him, uh, which I don't really watch documentaries, so it was already surprising that I did watch this. And something struck me. George Mueller was known to be a man of faith, a man of faith. And so, you know, a lot of people are called men of faith, women of faith, but he was called to be or known to be a man of faith. And it was because of the way that he constantly relied on God to provide for the orphanages that he uh, helped, um, uh, helped uh, make. And so, one of the stories that he shares is that he didn't necessarily uh, give all his money to these orphanages. A lot of the money and way that this was made was by donation, by people giving uh, to this orphanage. And there's uh, two particular stories I want to share with his story is that he, one time, uh, I guess they were um, running out of bread. And they didn't have bread at the orphanage, so they didn't know how they were going to feed these orphans. And so what George Mueller did, which I think is incredible, is he got everyone together, and they all prayed and thanked God for the food they were about to eat. But they had no food. They had no bread. But George Mueller had this faith that he knew that he was going to have food to feed to the orphans. And so right as they say amen, they get a knock on the door, and it's this delivery of bread. And they said, I just wanted to come by and, and give to this orphanage. So God answered their prayer instantaneously and provided food for them. Another time, uh, they were out of milk. And they didn't know how they were going to have milk and feed, again, these orphans. And so again, George Mueller prays and thanks God for the milk that will be coming their way. Again, no milk in sight, but he prayed and thanked God for this milk. And as they say amen, they get a knock on the door, and there's a milkman saying that uh, the, my, my, my truck or my, my wheels, something broke right in front of your orphanage, and I can't let this milk go bad. So I thought, why not and give to this orphanage? And so they had their milk. There's lots of stories in George Mueller's life and in his project with the orphans and the orphanages where we constantly see God's hand of provision and always constantly being faithful in his life and in the lives of the orphans that he was serving. So when I first heard this story, I thought, I want to be just like George Mueller. I was touched by his story and, and, and wanted to pray the same way. And so I made a radical prayer that day that I had no idea would actually be radical. But I just said, God, I want to live by faith. So lots of things happened after that. Uh, but I came across a verse. Um, it's found in 2 Timothy 4.2. And this is reading from the Passion Translation, but it says, Proclaim the word of God and stand upon it no matter what. Rise to the occasion and preach when it is convenient and when it is not. Preach in the full expression of the Holy Spirit with wisdom and patience as you instruct and teach the people. Now, preaching and teaching doesn't have to look like what I'm doing right now where I'm standing on a pulpit and I'm, and I'm sharing with you all, but preaching and teaching can look like conversating with someone and serving someone and giving a smile to someone and hugging someone. Whatever it may look like, it doesn't have to look like this. It can look like the way that we love one another, the way that we talk and respect each other. So I thought, okay, well then I'm going to go on a mission trip. Why not? And so I was, like it was mentioned, I was at Southern, 
And Southern has this culture of, uh, it's very mission-minded school, where almost everyone I knew at the time was serving uh, or had served as a missionary in the past for about a year. And so I thought, that's a long time. I don't know if I could do that, but I would love to go and just serve somewhere for a little bit. So there was this, uh, these opportunities to go and serve as a missionary for a month. So I thought, I can do a month. I can do a month. And so I signed up having no idea what I signed up for. I immediately thought it's going to be like VBS and, or building something. And while we love those mission trips, I, I thought that's what we were doing. I kid you not, I did not know what I had signed up for until I got there, which might sound kind of strange and funny, like, Alexi, why didn't you try to get more information before you went? So I got there and I realized that this was an evangelistic series that I had signed up for. Everyone that had went was also a theology major, so they were being trained to be pastors. At the time, I was studying psychology, had no idea that I was going to go into ministry uh, later in life, but it's just so ironic that I, I chose the, the, the mission that was just to preach when I had not really done that much in my life. I had signed up to go to Nicaragua, and I stayed there for a month, and we preached 17 times. And it wasn't just all together taking turns at one church. We each had a church. Some of us had two. Some had three. And so I went to Nicaragua, as you see in this picture. And uh, not only was, we, were, was I going to preach so many times, but I was also going to, I decided, I, I don't know why I had the courage, but I decided I'm going to preach in Spanish. And you don't know me very well, and I am Latina, very proud to be Latina, but my Spanish isn't the best. Uh, I don't feel very comfortable. Like I, if I were to come up here and speak in Spanish and preach, I don't think I'd feel as comfortable as I am right now. So the fact that I had the courage, something came over me to say, I'll preach in Spanish, I have no idea what that was. But I ended up uh, preaching and, and meeting lots of people, and we had an incredible time. And we also got to uh, get to know the other uh, people that were serving there for a month with me as well. And we, we got really close. And it was an incredible experience, the way that everything happened, the way that I connected with the people. I connected with um, the pastor's wife, who was incredible and uh, always calls, still to this day, says that she's my Nicaraguan mom. Um, and so she's incredible. And just the stuff that they would do in Nicaragua was just mind-blowing. And so at the end of my, my time there, we, had, we joined with, I think, four or five other churches and we had this uh, almost camp meeting style, and we had several people get baptized. And I remember thinking, this is incredible that I get to see, you know, people getting baptized and my first time ever really preaching. And it was just, I, I could not believe it. And so there we have a picture of uh, some of the, the kids that were there uh, in Nicaragua. And I, I still remember them to this day. I still have, um, I'm actually friends with some of them on, on Instagram and and uh, on Facebook still, but they really impacted me. And before I left, they actually did this like going away party for me at the service. And I remember getting teary eyed. I'm like, whoa, I've been here for one month and I cannot believe I'm this emotional about leaving, but it really touched my heart. And so because I went on this month long mission trip, I thought, well, maybe I can go away for a year. So after my uh, senior year, I decided that I was going to go and serve somewhere else. And, and the story of how that happened is, is pretty long and just in, it, interesting how God worked. But I felt the calling to go to an island nation, uh, which I hear that you all are going to one soon, uh, Palau. And it's in the Pacific Ocean. And uh, that's a picture I took actually before I left. Um, and it was, uh, I took a plane ride and um, was able to take it on my iPhone. So incredible. Um, but that's just some of the islands that were on um, in Palau. And so I went and served there and I taught eighth grade. I taught 29 uh, children, which was just insane because again, I had just graduated with psychology, had never been a teacher before, absolutely knew nothing about education. Um, and so as a missionary, they just kind of throw you out there and you just pray and hope for the best. And so I taught eighth grade 
And I had an incredible experience there. So many highs, so many lows, but God's faithfulness was there the entire time. And so um, crazy story now is that some of those students are sophomores in college now, and they are at La Sierra, some of them, and I get to see them uh, now. I work right next to the university there. Uh, but it's just interesting how God worked, how God sent me there, and they impacted me more than anything. Um, and so I realized that this was an experience that I was never going to forget about. Uh, and when I left Palau, um, it was the hardest experience. So when I, when I was there, I was like, well, when I left Nicaragua, I was really teary-eyed. I was really emotional after one month. I cannot imagine what it will feel like after one year of being somewhere. And so uh, in this picture, I have uh, four of my students students, um, some were in eighth and some were in seventh, um, getting baptized. And it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful there. But when I left, I had a really, really hard time. I remember uh, in Palau, the culture is when you arrive to the airport, everyone's there to greet you. When you're leaving, everyone's there to send you off. Even if it's just, I'm leaving for a week or I'm leaving for a weekend, everyone is there. That is what they do in Palau. So when I was leaving for the year, after my year, uh, all my students went there, and it was just very, very emotional, and I was crying a lot, and I just could not imagine that I was leaving this place that I loved so much. And I even got to a point where I almost became angry with God. God, why would you send me here if I was just going to have my heart broken? Why would you send me here if I was only going to be able to stay for one year? But I realized that God doesn't always keep us in places for a long time. Sometimes he asks, asks us to go somewhere, to plant a seed, and let God do the rest, leave them in God's hands. And so I left Palau, and that's when I went to uh, the seminary. So uh, it was a very different experience, uh, being in a tropical place and then going to uh, the I want to say the tundra of Berrien Springs, Michigan. And uh, I, I dealt with a lot of things that year. I remember I was very um, almost depressed just because of dealing with the, the grief of leaving this island home that I still love uh, to this day. And so when I came back, I thought, you know, maybe I'll do this long term. Maybe I'll go and serve as a missionary for the rest of my life after this. I actually really thought that that's what God was calling me to. And so when I was in seminary and figuring out what I wanted to do with ministry, um, I started to realize that missions doesn't just have to be 9,000 miles away in Palau or in Central America, Nicaragua, or anywhere. Missions can happen wherever we are. Sometimes God calls us to, uh, I saw that you are all doing a homeless ministry, ask us to go and feed the homeless, or, or does ask us to go and travel a bit, or maybe it's just, again, within our church walls and being kind to one another and loving one another and loving people that, you know, don't, we don't really agree with outside of these walls. And so I realized that being a missionary can look and feel so different than what I've always thought it was. So in Acts 8, I love, I love this, um, that Philip actually was a missionary uh, in himself. And so Philip is known for carrying the gospel to the marginalized Samaritans. He preached in the city of Samaria to large crowds. So he was preaching to big crowds, uh, probably, you know, feeling that calling, that spirit, that fire within him. And it says, but the Holy Spirit led him out into the wilderness to preach to a single person. He called Philip out of this place where he was reaching lots of people, but he called him out of there to go and preach to one single person. And this person was an Ethiopian eunuch. This man was actually reading the book of Isaiah as he traveled, but he did not understand what he was reading. Philip showed him from the scriptures how he could be saved. And after leading the Ethiopian to the Lord and baptizing him, Philip continued on his trip to the coast and eventually to the city of Caesarea. And that's where he established a church. And so we find this story actually in Acts 8, and I think it's incredible um, how God called Philip specifically to go and speak to this person. So we're going to kind of read uh, this, this, uh, this, um, this section here. It's Acts 8, 26 to 39, if you would like to follow along. And I'm going to read from the message translation. 
And it says, later God's angel spoke to Philip. At noon today, very specific, at noon today, I want you to walk over to that desolate road that goes from Jerusalem down to Gaza. And so I think about this, that God not only called him at a specific time, but he sent him to a specific place and makes sure that he says it's a desolate road. There's not many people here. So Philip, the obedient missionary, he gets up and went. He met an Ethiopian eunuch coming down the road. The eunuch had been on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and was returning to Ethiopia where he was minister in charge of all the finances of the queen of the Ethiopians. He was riding in a chariot and reading the prophet Isaiah. The spirit told Philip, climb into the chariot. Running up alongside, Philip heard the eunuch reading Isaiah and asked, do you understand what you're reading? He answered, how can I without some help? And invited Philip into the chariot with him. I love this because sometimes when we don't understand, sometimes we are afraid to ask and see, can you help me understand this better? Or sometimes our pride gets in the way and we think, no, I understand it. I don't need any help. But I love that both of them are willing to help and to listen and to understand. So he says, um, he says, uh, the passage he said he was reading was this, as a sheep led to slaughter and quiet as a lamb being sheared, he was silent saying nothing. He was mocked and put down, never got a fair trial, but who now can count his skin, skin he, since he's been taken from the earth, the eunuch said. Tell me, who is the prophet talking about, himself or some other? And so Philip grabbed at his chance. He grabbed at his chance, using this passage as his text. He preached Jesus to him. Again, he wasn't up here on a pulpit preaching Jesus. He was having a conversation with someone who needed and asked for help. He wanted to know, who is this man? And he took the chance and preached to him, this is who Jesus is. As they continued down the road, they came to um, a stream of water. And the eunuch said, well, here's water. Why can't I be baptized? I love this because he realized in that moment that I want to be saved. I want to know who Jesus is and I want to be fully immersed in the water and become baptized. So they both went down to the water and Philip baptized him on the spot. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of God suddenly took Philip off. And that was the last the eunuch saw of him. But he didn't mind. He had what he'd come for and went on down the road as happy as he should be. You see, when we encounter God, we are changed. When we encounter God, we want to share him with others. When we encounter God, we are filled with love, we are filled with his spirit, and almost everything about us is different. We see things in a different way. We love in a different way. We act in a different way. It's not a matter of following a set of rules, but actually following because you love. It comes out of love. So again, I mentioned that I had, I had been a missionary for a month and then a year, and I thought, this is what it looks like. But then I realized that there are other types of mission fields. So there was this one summer uh, where I served at a camp um, actually in Arizona. And I did, had no idea, had never been there, had no idea who was going to be there, uh, went there on a, on a whim. Um, again, very young, I think, when you're very young, you make decisions, you're just like, hey, why not? So I was like, I don't know anyone in, in Arizona, but I'm going to go anyway, and I'm just going to see what's out there. And so that was the first of six, seven years of summer camp that I had never realized was going to impact me this much. And the reason I loved camp, and camp in general still to this day, is because I truly believe from the bottom of my heart that camp ministry is a mission field. We see so many kids come from different walks of life. Um, at this specific camp, we had lots of foster care uh, campers come to our camp, and we were trained and, and always reminded that this may be the only chance that a camper gets to hear about Jesus, ever. Ever. We have a responsibility to represent him well with the way that we talk to each other, with the way that we treat that camper, with the way that we sing our songs, even just with a smile. And so we took it very seriously. And let me say, it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do because I had to see some really sad situations play out at this camp um, with, with realizing where they came from and just my heart being broken with the stories that they would tell me. But it only reminded me again that God called us to this mission field, camp, 
where we can show him for who he really is to our campers. But what's interesting is that not only did our campers get impacted, but our staff were constantly impacted by the ministry that we were doing. It's almost as if there was like an overflow of blessing and it was pouring out onto us who were serving. And so it was at camp, uh, where, when I was a camper actually, where I first saw a real glimpse of God and I realized, wow, this is fun. And so as a staff member, I realized this continues. We constantly see a glimpse of God when we serve and when we are here at this camp, uh, this mission field that God has called us to. It's where I saw lots of people give their lives to Christ, whether they were young as 8 years old or um, as old as our staff at 21, 22 years old. I saw many lives changed at camp. And so I realized in that moment again that This is where family is made. This is where uh, I met some of my best friends, actually, to this day. Uh, That picture right there is one of my closest friends uh, who I had met my first summer at that camp. Um, And that was one of our last summers together where she uh, gave her life to Christ. It was a very emotional moment, but I remember thinking that this was a place that fostered this relationship with God for her and for so many other people. And so I realize again that the mission field does not look uh, one way. It does not look like you t- getting on a plane and going far, far away. It looks like every day encountering people, different people, people that are like us. It's the, the small interactions where the mission field is at. And so, like was mentioned, I am the assistant director, um, youth director for summer camp. And uh, we are here because we are coming from Pine Springs Ranch, and our summer camp uh, is all of July. We have family camp uh, where families can come together and have a week of camp, and then we have kids camps for kids as young as seven all the way up until 17. And we are also still hiring um, our staff, and if you work for us, uh, you get a college scholarship uh, for working at camp. But not only that, you get to Go to a place away from everything and deepen your relationship with God. Get away from everything and help plant that seed in a camper's life. And maybe even so, maybe camp is for you. Maybe camp is for you as an adult, as a staff member, uh, where you get to experience God in a new and creative way. So I want to share with you all that uh, God has called us all to be missionaries of some sort. Just hearing the special music earlier today, I thought, wow, that is so fitting uh, because people do need the Lord. And sometimes that is not, again, just coming up here and preaching and going far away, but it's just by the way that we love one another because out of the overflow of God's love, we can in turn love others very deeply. So we have this responsibility whether it's talking to one single person like Philip did, or going somewhere and serving and building um, something for people, or going and serving at our camp. Uh, We have this responsibility to love on people, to show these people who God is, and to constantly be good representations of Christ's love.